Hey guys, welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from the very first state to declare its independence, Rhode Island. Let's talk about how you can invest in real estate and gain financial freedom, shall we? If you're thinking about investing passively in real estate and you want to learn how to evaluate a deal, I created a free guide that walks you through the top five critical deal components that any passive investor must examine, especially during COVID. So you can find it on my website, ellieperlman.com. Okay, so let's start the show. My guest today is Chris Larson. So Chris is the founder and managing partner of Next Level Income and has been investing in and managing real estate for over 20 years. While still in college student, still a college student, he bought his first rental property at the age of 21. And I know a lot of us say, maybe not to others, but to ourselves, I wish, I wish we started when we were in college. Um, so he's one of the few people that actually did it. And from there, he expanded into development, private lending, buying distressed debt, and commercial offices. So he's doing a lot of things, which is very exciting, very interesting. He began syndicating deals in 2016 and Chris actually raised more than $15 million and been actively involved in over 150 million of real estate acquisitions. Chris currently lives in Asheville, North Carolina with his wife and two boys, which I've met about a year ago in, um, in, in Colorado um, during a conference that we both attended. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Ali. Great to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you're in, in North Carolina. It's a very interesting market. It's one of the markets we're actually looking into. Um, yeah. So how are you also, are you buying in, in uh, North Carolina? Yeah, we live in Asheville, which is a little bit of a smaller market for us. So we haven't focused um, on locations in Asheville. We certainly have properties in Asheville. But uh, yeah, we're focused on some of the bigger markets like Raleigh, like Charlotte, as well as mm -hmm. Greenville and Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, all great markets. Um, so Chris, can you, let's start with um, just telling me and the listeners a little bit about, you know, your background and how you got started in real estate. And obviously we just heard that you bought your first real estate when you were 21, but if you yeah. can give, give a little bit more, you know, color to it, that would be great. Yeah, well, I'm happy to share. And if, if you're listening and you want to learn more, I have my book on our website at nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link. Um, but yeah, I talk about how I started at age 21 and it was a turning point for me, Ellie. So when I was, when I was in high school and college, I raced my bike and all I wanted to do was be a professional cyclist. So I was going to school for engineering. I was racing my bike. I thought I'm just going to get through school, race my bike for a while, be a professional and then come back and figure out like what I want to do as an adult. A couple of things. One, when you race bicycles, especially, you know, if you're not like a, uh, a like a European level pro, like somebody like Lance Armstrong, um, or at that level, you don't make very good money. And I wanted to have freedom and the ability to to have a life. So I always was entrepreneurial. I had a loft business in college. I sold wrapping paper when I was 12 years old. Had a paper route, those sorts of things. And I had uh, interest in investing. I was day trading in college. During my freshman, sophomore, junior years, kind of during this period where I was learning about investing, my best friend passed away. He's uh, a year younger than me. So in between my freshman and sophomore year, uh, he died. I raced my bike for another year, kind of put my head down. It was my therapy. It was my outlet. After a year, I realized that I just wasn't, I wasn't really enjoying it. I wasn't happy anymore. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't have any regrets in life. I wanted to live my fullest life. So my interest in investing and having some sort of um, business or capital while I was racing transitioned over into really my, my new focus, which was having the freedom to live the best life that I had. And that's what drove me to buy that first property at 21. From there, I, I bought several more uh, single family rentals and I thought, hey, if I can just pay these off, I'll, I'll have a pretty good lifestyle. And that was my goal for several years until about seven years ago during another turning point. I looked at my portfolio and realized the returns I was getting weren't fantastic. And during a conversation at a business meeting with my wife, I was talking to somebody about apartment investing. I thought, that's ah, just, it's the same thing, but I, I had to investigate it. And what I found was it was significantly different. Investing in commercial real estate, income producing commercial real estate had the ability to be passive. I know you love all these aspects, cash flow, appreciation, and 
I saw some great tax benefits for high income professionals and we were doing pretty well, my wife and I at the time. So these, that was a significant benefit. And over the next few years, we transitioned our entire portfolio over into commercial real estate. That's wonderful. So you, you basically, you know, you saw the, the benefits of multifamily and that's, uh, that's a good segue to our, you know, the, the asset aspect of the show. You talked about multifamily and I'm wondering, you know, obviously the, I, I think the same in terms of, you know, the tax benefits, appreciation, et cetera. So it's, it's funny because actually, if you think about it, multifamily has appreciation and depreciation. So you can use depreciation for tax purposes, but the asset appreciates if you push the income, if you push the net operating income, uh, you know, higher than it was when you bought it. So it actually appreciates. So you can sell it at a higher price, even though the value of the brick and mortar, the stones, the, whatever is built, the, the wood is actually for tax purposes, deteriorating, which is, you know, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, Chris, what do you do during COVID to protect your assets, to protect your multifamily properties? Yeah, so there's, there's several aspects to this, you know, when it comes to um, kind of protection, really, number one is the residents, right? You want to make sure that the residents feel safe. They, you know, we're taking all precautions that we can. And if the residents feel safe and they want to stay in the property, that's obviously good for the financial security of the property. So we shut down a lot of the common areas in COVID. We've increased cleaning. Um, you know, we've uh, done things like host um, food trucks. So residents can, you know, they can have some sort of dining experience, but they don't have to go out. They don't have to leave mm -hmm. the property. So they stay a little bit closer. Um, you know, so those are, those are some of the big things with respect to that. Uh, on, the, on the other side, like when it comes to evaluating properties or, you know, if we're doing due diligence and, act, you know, with the acquisition like we are during the process right now, we've been significantly more conservative. So if we may, like the property we're uh, in process of acquiring, we're assuming basically flat or no rental increases for a couple of years, just because we want to be very conservative. On a value add deal, we're increasing by 50% or more the timeline to turn units, and we're also decreasing the uh, occupancy. So we're assuming that vacancies go up slightly. It's going to take us longer to turn units, maybe because uh, residents aren't moving as much, and it's going to uh, be challenging to do that. And then also, we're going to assume that there may be some um, pressure on, on moving rent. So we're trying to be conservative in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally share your conservative approach. Uh, and I think it's, it's actually, if you think about it, it's, it's safer to underwrite something now when you know what could happen than if you, you know, some sponsors underwritten a deal or some investors a year, two years ago, three years ago, and assume that in the next five to seven years, rents are going to keep increasing. And this yeah. year might not be the case. So in that sense, it's actually, I'm not going to say safer to invest. There's risk in any investment, but it's, I think it's easier to look at an underwriting and understand if it's conservative or not, because you're not assuming that rents just can grow year over year with, you know, for the next five years. Um, and I think that's, that's a great approach to, to just assume that rents are not going to increase, even though you're probably going to try and do it and, and see if this is possible. But for, returns for the underwriting purposes, you're not assuming you can raise rents, which I think is, is a really, really good approach. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think the more challenging properties are the ones like we acquired a year ago that, you know, we're right in the middle of, you know, renovations and, and moving rents. And that's obviously slowed some things down. It's definitely impacted cash flows, but I can, it's a lot better, I think, to buy it, you know, a dip in the market, which I consider uh, the point that we are right now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Chris, I want to switch, you know, gears and talk a little bit about strategy. One of the things that you're doing is in infinite banking, um, or infinite banking. Uh, so can you explain to me and the audience, what is it exactly? And, and, and how do you use that strategy to build your family's wealth? Cause I know, you know, you're father of two and obviously, you're concerned with building, with creating, building wealth, growing wealth for the benefit of your family. And I think that would resonate with a lot of our listeners that are in kind of very similar position to yours. 
Yeah, I think it's it's a great strategy that I started learning about um, about let's see here just over ten years ago. So I was I was a licensed insurance agent. Um, I was working for State Farm. This was when I was finishing my MBA. And what I learned then, Ellie, is a lot of people hear, oh, buy term and invest the difference. And that, that's fine if you're, you know, if you're kind of following the Dave Ramseys and maxing out your 401ks, paying off all your debt. But if you want to create true wealth, like I talk about in my book, you need to invest like the rich. So I actually rewrote my book. I added a chapter. It's chapter three. It's called Your Opportunity Fund. And what I learned about 10 years ago was that if you carefully structure life insurance, you can structure it to minimize the fees. You can structure it to maximize the cash value. And it's really interesting. It's almost like real estate in the sense that you have a set premium amount that you're paying for a period of time. And like, let's say you're 30 years old as I was, and you say, okay, I'm going to have paid up policy at age 60. It's kind of like a 30 year mortgage. Well, during that, pol- during that term of that policy, your equity increases and the cost stays flat. And what's interesting is you can pull that equity out. You can pull that cash value out just like you can with like a home equity line of credit. So you have equity that increases, you have the ability to pull money out. And what I talk about in my book is you can use that money in two places at once. So what you can do is you can use that money for an emergency fund. You can use it for paying for a car. You can like self-finance essentially instead of going to a bank. Then you can pay yourself back. You get the interest instead of the bank Mm -hmm. getting the interest. You can also use it for things like paying for college. So 529 plan is great if you're saving for college, if you want to be in a tax efficient way. But what if your child gets a scholarship or what if they decide not to go to college? So I have a friend and he said, I wish I knew about this because my son decided he didn't want to use that money for school. That, that presents a challenge if, if that money's stuck in an account that has to be used for college. So you can use it for that. And then my favorite and what we've been using is using that money to finance cash flow investments specifically in real estate. So if you can borrow out of these policies, and again, it has to be a pr- properly structured policy. If you can borrow out at a net 2 or 3% interest rate, it's like, it's like pulling money out of, uh, out of your own residence and invest it and get, say, 5 6 or 7% return, cash return, and have growth on the back end. It can be a very powerful way to basically arbitrage um, that. And I, you know, I'm, I talk about this in my book. It's not, don't think about it like an investment. You have to think about it like a savings account. And I, talk, I say it's like my supercharged savings account because people say, well, Chris, I don't know if life insurance is a great investment. I said, you're right. It's, it, don't think of it like an investment. It's a tool. It's a tool to prevent having your family worry about if, if you're not there anymore, if they can survive. And then it's a tool to save and grow the wealth of your family. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really, really smart strategy. And, you know, I've been working with several family offices, which are offices that have, you know, they've, they've created an enormous amount of wealth and that's what they do. They borrow money, even though they have a lot of money, especially now during COVID, a lot of them are sitting on piles of cash. Their, their strategy is usually exactly like what you, you mentioned. They, they borrow money at a low interest rate because they're strong borrowers. They invest this money and they're basically, you know, they borrow two, two and a half, three percent. They're making five to eight percent. And the delta is just pure profit on money that they didn't even, it wasn't even theirs to begin that's with. That's right. And so, and that's the beauty. I think it's, un, it's exactly the opposite of what Dave Ramsey is, is lecturing. I mean, if you look at the wealthiest family in the world, that's what they do. They actually use debt to create more wealth. And of course, there's a risk in, in any investment. Of course, if you take, you know, if you borrow 50, 100, 200K and the investment goes sideways, something happens, you're not going to see the money. But what about all the other investments? It's, it's, I think in certain investments, even today, losing your, your um, principal is kind of an extreme scenario. The, a more reasonable scenario is if you invested and instead of getting 8% or 7% return every year, you got five or you get four, but to lose your investment, that, that would take, um, I think a very, very extreme situation, you know, to happen. Yeah. Especially in a lot of the investments that we talk about, Ellie, which are, you know, they're stabilized assets. They're typically backed by like Fannie or Freddie, Mm -hmm. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans, you know, agency debt. They're, they're stabilized already. 
you know, talking about multifamily, people always need a place to live. So yeah, if you're, if you're properly underwriting deals, I agree. Like a lot of these investments have a high degree of safety. And, you know, one of the interesting things is if you borrow against your cash value and your life insurance, you're, you're very flexible in paying it back. You don't have to qualify for it. You don't have to um, ask, ask, you know, go through underwriting for a loan. You do this for the money. The bank sends it to you and you can pay it back on your schedule or not pay it back. And think about it from the opposite side. So life insurance companies, a lot of them own a lot of very high quality real estate across the country. What, what's even more safer than that? A loan on their policy holders where they hold the, the opposite side of that policy, right? So if you have a million dollar policy and you borrow $100,000 and you never pay it back, the insurance company just deducts that from the proceeds that go to your family. So it's, it's very safe. You know, the real estate, I'm sorry, the insurance company has to invest to get a return right. to provide for cash flow um, for the for the business and the operations. So it's it's a win win on both sides. And Chris, in in this strategy, is there kind of a limit to the type or size of properties that you can invest in? No, it's all it's all based upon the cash value of your of your policies. So mm-hmm. you know, it's there's a couple different ways to do it. The way we did it and started out was we just put money in consistently every month until our cash value grew. You can also um, you can do a one you can fund like you can take a hundred thousand dollars and put it into your policy and then pull that money right back out. Um, it's typically not one for one the first year because there are fees associated with it. You're paying for insurance. So there's the cost of that insurance. So that's something to consider. But typically, if it's structured properly, you're going to break even within less than five years. And then at that point forward, essentially, the insurance is paying for itself. So I, I, tell, you know, I tell anybody that's considering the strategy, you know, don't, don't think about it like, okay, I'm going to do this today. You know, I get something for nothing. I'm just going to put the money in. I get free insurance and, and take money back out. It, it has to pay for itself over a period of time. But it's up to you. You can put 100000 in. You can put a million in. You can fund these policies. Um, it's small and monthly. You can, you can structure them so you can dump extra money in like we did when we got uh, bonus checks, for instance, from um, my role in, as a medical device rep. So they're very flexible. And the key is you need to work with an agent or a group that specializes in this. So one, you work with the right insurance company, you have the right policy, and then you have the right mix of uh, policy components. So you have the flexibility to do this. It's not, you know, don't just walk down to your local insurance agent and, hey, this is what I want to do. Um, so, sometimes they can do it. Um, if they can, chances are they're not specialized in, in this sort of strategy. Um, and even worse is they say they can do it and then you, you don't have the ability to uh, borrow against these policies in the right way. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, how long have you been doing this? Uh, we started our policies uh, the year before my oldest son, Ethan, that you know, you got, we were talking about earlier in the show that you met, uh, was born. Yeah. Um, that was in 2009. So we've had our policies. Oh, wow. Actually, in, uh, we're recording in October. It's been 11 years. Wow. All right. Yeah, yeah. it's not something that, I, um, that I've heard a lot of investors talk about. It's mainly either you, you invest actively or you invest you know, passively in a syndication. So that's really interesting to learn. And, and I love learning, you know, new concepts of investments and, and kind of enrich my, it enriches my world of how you can, and it's another way of investing, which was really interesting, you know, to, to be exposed to. Um, Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, it, you know, some people may be listening say, well, geez, Chris, you know, you say, don't, you know, you got to have it, it's got to be structured this way. Um, you have to speak to the right agent. We have a video and a, a white paper on our website as well. So that's under the banking link. So if you are interested and you want to learn more, you can check that out. And again, there's, there's a lot of different groups out there that can do it, but we have some resources on our website to help you educate yourself if you're interested. That's great. All right. That's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the process you've, uh, of evaluating deals during COVID. We talked about a little bit earlier on how you underwrite a deal during COVID. Um, and obviously, you know, right now, and we're recording this in October 2020, there, there are more deals out there than there were when COVID just hit or when we, were, yeah. when we became aware of COVID around uh, February or March. There are more deals, there are more buyers that are back in the market. I mean, we were buying, you're actively buying as well. From a passive investor's point of view, 
what would be your recommendation for someone who's looking at a deal and he's considering maybe two or three different deals from two, three different syndicators and on paper, you know, many deals can look really great. The numbers look great. What would be your advice for kind of the, the first, you know, few steps in evaluating a deal from a passive investor's point of view during COVID? Yeah. So Ellie, it's, I think it's a super question uh, during this time period. And I would say there's really three things to look at. One, you need to be uh, comfortable with the market you're investing in. You need to be comfortable with the operator you're investing in. And then you look at the actual deal and the specifics within that. So let's kind of walk through those things. Number one, if you're an investor, um, we moved to the Southeast because of the strength of the demographics and the fundamentals um, over 12 years ago. You know, we wanted to move in, into an area where there was kind of this rising tide, like I talk about in my book, where people are moving and fueling job growth and, you know, also real estate prices, right? Which also fuels rent increase if you're in the multifamily market. You want to be in a diverse economic base. So you want to make sure that the cities you're in, you know, don't have an, um, a, a tremendous adverse impact from COVID, like maybe New York City or something like that, where mm -hmm. people are exiting, um, they can't do business like they used to. You want to be in a diverse economic base. Um, number two, if you're talking about the operator, you want to make sure that your operator is comfortable in these markets. They have executed in these markets before, and they've also executed in the type of assets. So one thing that we've done, uh, we've started to look at deals, Ellie, that are a little bit higher up the food chain in terms of of resident quality. So what I mean by that is, you know, what we've seen, and we started doing this over a year ago, because um, looking at kind of the economic cycles, we had some concerns with where the economy was going. We wanted to make sure that we had um, higher average incomes in our property. So you know, if you talk about the difference between a $40,000 employee and somebody that's making 60, 70 or $80,000, the chances of employee that's making 40,000 losing their job during a market like this or being able to make their rent is higher than somebody that maybe be a white collar worker. Maybe they're in technology, maybe they're in healthcare and they can work from home or they're not going to lose their job. So one of the things that we've added is we're doing basically uh, a residence survey um, during our rent do, um, our rent roll due diligence to see, okay, who is at risk? And we kind of, we kind of rank that risk. And what we've seen very closely is that if we say 2% of our residents are in a high risk demographic, our collections are typically about 98%. So it's very interesting how our collections have tracked that risk profile. So that's a, that's a specific tool that we've been using. Uh, with respect to that. Uh, you know, I talked about the, the kind of the quality of the deals that we've been looking at. Uh, the challenge you face is, you know, normally we'd bring our entire team on site and we'd be doing due diligence. And now you may not be able to do that because there's restrictions on travel and the property. So we've had limited teams going in to do due diligence. And we've been doing more things like video, like drone footage, um, using other technologies that, that have been out there, but we haven't necessarily been using. It's Frankly, it's more fun to be doing stuff in person. And I've still been going to the properties and touring them, but maybe not going through all the units like I used to. Um, maybe doing more of a free look um, on the in interiors and then focusing more on the exteriors and relying more on that technology uh, going inside. Yeah, things have definitely changed. And uh, due diligence is... is uh, you know, a lot more challenging than it was. You need to wear, you know, hazmat suits before you send, you know, you, you, ha yeah. you have to have your team wear those before they go in and, and review yeah. the, uh, the units. Cause how do you do, you, you know, unit walks, you need to walk all of them. Right. Um, yep. I think one interesting question from a passive investor would be, you know, to inquire a little bit more about the level of due diligence that you've done during COVID. Some, some uh, buyers are okay with not walking even one unit and you know that's that's an enormous amount of risk in my opinion that you're taking yeah. and some buyers are walking all units and that's basically what what we've done but we do it a bit differently it's four or five different teams of one person so they're not right. exposing the entire community so it's in and out very quickly with all the hazmat suits, spraying, you know, Lysol. So there's a protocol of how you do it. And then in between you have basically buyers that are visiting a hand, I don't know if a handful, but a X percent of the units and taking a risk on the other, you know, portion that they're not walking. So you got to 
and I'm not saying that one way is be better than the other with the exception of not walking any unit. I think it's just a lot more risky, but it's important to understand what level of due diligence the, the syndicator or the sponsor was making because there's going to be surprises and in every deal. There are surprises and you want to minimize, right. you know, the number of surprises that you're going to face once you close. That's right. And I, I think your, your approach is spot on, Ellie. You know, we've, we've basically gone to minimizing the size of teams that are doing this. And whereas, you know, the entire team, we might have like 10 people walking these units. Now, like you said, it may be one, maybe two that are doing this. And then the rest of the team is relying on, um, you know, their input and some of the technology to do that. So, and that minimizes obviously the risk to our team, but also it minimizes the exposure on the property and makes, makes sure that, you know, anybody that's there on the property is comfortable as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, interesting times. Uh, I'm, I can't wait for this whole period to be over. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely challenging, but it's also intriguing and fun and exciting. It's all of the above when you're, when you're dealing, you know, with, with the new deal that, that comes your way, especially now during COVID and we're actively buying in the market. You're actively buying in the market, um, right now. And I think you're absolutely right that the focus on the population, the, the tenant and the kind of immediate area, the strength of that immediate area is super, super important. If, you know, you thought that 40 or 45K a year as a, as a median household income could be an okay area to invest a year ago, now there's a big question mark around it because these are, these are the, the you know, this is the population that is going to default and not pay rent for the most part, more, more likely than someone like you've mentioned is making 70 or 60, $80,000 a year. That's, that's Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Spot on. And I, and I think if you're an investor, you know, it's a good, it's good to say, Hey, maybe, you know, maybe I need to, you know, moderate my expectations on returns. If you're nervous about that, you can say, Absolutely. Hey, you know, would I be okay if my returns were a little bit less? And I think if you, as you go up the spectrum, if you say, Hey, if my resident quality is higher, and there's a little less upside, maybe there's a little less value add, but my returns are going to be more stable. So as an investor, you just have to ask how much risk you're willing to take at this, at this point. And, you know, it's, that's, that's up to the individual investors. But I think, you know, we kind of have talked about some things that can help make that decision. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Chris. So we have arrived to the lightning round questions. Are you ready? Go for it. <laughs> All right. So I think I already know the answer to the first one, but what's your favorite hobby? I'm still a cyclist. So it's, uh, now that I have kids, it, it really is. It's kind of a ability to get out and get a little me time. And I live in Asheville, which is just, I mean, if I look out the windows right now, it's just gorgeous this time of year. So it's, uh, I feel very, very blessed to be in this, this type of environment to ride. All right. Um, the second question is what's the one thing that people don't know about you? One thing people don't know about me, hmm, my wife's Canadian. That's a little interesting. Ah. <laughs> Where did you meet her? I met her in college. So, uh, yeah, she, she was born in Montreal, but she's lived in the United States most of her life. So I, I joke around. I say, I, sometimes I say she's Swedish. She is Swedish, but so I said, <laughs> oh, she's from Sweden. She's from Canada. But who knows? We'll see how things go in this country. Maybe we'll move back to Canada at some point. <laughs> All right. Um, so what do you wish you had known when you just started investing in real estate, you know, in your case, when you were 21 years old? Yeah, I wish I, I got, I was given some advice about commercial real estate, about going to man, like go manage commercial properties. And I really do wish I knew the differences between uh, owning commercial real estate versus residential. Um, you know, starting at 21, great, but if you can go back and do it the right way for all those mm -hmm. years, it would have been even greater. All right. What's the number one advice that you have for real estate investors who basically they, you know, want to get in the business or scale their real estate business? Yeah. Look, Ellie, I, I love what you do with your podcast this business. I think the best advice I have is if you're an investor and you want to grow, you want to scale, you want to learn, work with somebody like you yourself, Ellie. Um, I think being an investor, that's how I started. It's a great way, you know, start as an investor, partner with somebody, learn the right way to do it there's a lot less downside than just swinging for the fences doing that. Um, and you know, I always talk about the value of a mentor. So if you want to grow, find somebody that you can emulate, that's achieved the success that you want, reach out to them and work with them. That's going to, that's going to help you do it not only faster, but also minimize that downside. 
Yep. Absolutely. All right. So Chris, where can uh, our listeners, where can they find you if they want to reach out to you and talk about investing? Yeah. So we try to make it easy. It's all next level income. So nextlevelincome.com. You can get our book next level income at the website. Um, just click on the book link. As I mentioned, Ellie, you can also click on the banking link to learn a little more about the infinite banking. And if there's a specific question you have for me, it's chris at nextlevelincome.com. All right. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It was, you know, great seeing you again. Um, and uh, I hope that you and the boys and your wife are going to be fine, you know, during COVID. It's definitely challenging times. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll meet again, right? Probably after I COVID. I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. Stay healthy and happy up there and congrats on the, on the move across the, uh, to the other coast here. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So that's all that that's what I have for you guys today. Be bold, be great and keep moving forward. And I'll see you on the next episode.